Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number 10, and I'm going to discuss the Bohr magneton. I've written the titles of the previous nine videos in this section on the bottom left of your screen. Now we're going to need video number 10 and video number 9 in order to discuss the next topic, which is magnetization, where we discuss paramagnetism and diamagnetism. So let's begin. Let's consider an orbiting electron around a central nucleus. So the central nucleus is given at this, the center of this, this particular circle here, and we have an electron orbiting in an anti-clockwise direction here. Let's just say. So its, its speed is going to be given in an anti-clockwise direction, and it is orbiting at a distance small r from the center of the uh, center of the atom or the center of the nucleus. Now we know, of course, that uh, an electron orbiting in an anti-clockwise direction constitutes a current in a clockwise direction. So for that reason, I have noted that we have a current going in a clockwise direction here. Next, let's consider the angular, angular momentum. Capital L is given by m outside of v cross r. So I like to compute the cross product using my left hand. In order to do this, I point my index finger of my left hand in the direction of the first component, in this case V. Then I will extend my thumb perpendicular to my index finger, and I'll rotate my hand until my thumb points in the direction of the, uh, the second component, which is R. I will then extend my middle finger perpendicular to my palm, and that will give us the direction of the angular momentum. If you do that, you'll see the angular momentum in this case is perpendicular to the current loop, and it's given in this direction here. So it's upwards as we look at, uh, at the video. Note, of course, that the area of the current loop is simply going to be given by pi r squared. Nothing out of the ordinary there at all. So the next thing I'd like to consider is the direction of the magnetic moment. We know that the magnetic moment is given by the formula of I, the current, multiplied by a, which is the vector area. So how do we, how do we calculate this? Well, first of all, let's, uh, let's, I suppose one way of doing it is using the, the right-hand rule. So we can do the following. If you curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the, of, uh, in the, direction of the current and extend your thumb perpendicular, it'll give you the direction of your uh, magnetic moment. So we see that the magnetic moment is an actual fact pointing to the bottom whereas the angular momentum is going to the top. All right, so where do we go from here? I said in previous videos that a single electron does not constitute current. However, if you have a, an electron orbiting, let's say, the nucleus of an atom at a very high speed, it can be approximated to be a current. So let's consider the current associated with an orbiting electron. So you have the the electron's charge, let's call it E, divided by the time for one revolution. So one revolution is going to be the it's going to be the circumference twice by R divided by the speed of the revolution. So we get the magnitude of the current is E times V over twice pi R. It's important to note that for an electron the charge is minus Q. So that's just something we're going to have to keep in our heads. So applying the magnetic moment, I times A, we see that in actual fact the magnetic moment is EV over twice pi r times pi r squared, or is one half EVR. So, and I say this a few times, and I probably should write it this way. I'm going to write it as um, EVR, and it's going to be a minus because for, that's going to be for an electron because the charge is negative. And if we think about this, we can write it in terms of the angular momentum m is equal to v cross r, excuse me, not r cross v. So we can write it as e over twice m times the magnitude of the angular momentum. And notice, of course, that if we're talking about the moment for an electron, there's going to be a minus sign here. Now, we know, of course, from a small bit of quantum mechanics that the angular momentum l is actually quantized in units of h bar, which is Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. So H bar is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, or h over 2 pi, and it is the fundamental unit of angular momentum. So that means that if you 
have zero, let's say you have one unit of angular momentum, then you have h bar units. And if you have two units, then you have twice h bar and so on. And I'm after noting, by the way, that this is this is an actual fact h, not h bar. There, like that. So that means we can rewrite the angular momentum as n an integer times h bar. And we can rewrite the, the uh, Bohr magneton, which we call the, the magnetic moment here, as n times e h bar over twice m. And we call this the Bohr magneton. So it's e h bar over twice m. Note, of course, for an electron that E is equal to minus Q, and I keep saying that because in the next video, when we discuss diamagnetism, it is the fact that E has a minus, a minus sign that constitutes or allows us to have diamagnetism. Otherwise, we would have, uh, we would just have, I suppose we would have, all of our uh, magnetization would be in the direction of applied fields. So the magnitude of the Bohr magneton is 9.27 times 10 to the minus 24 amps meter squared and it is the magnetic dipole moment due to the orbit of an atomic electron. Now I've tried to reiterate a number of times that the minus sign on the charge is very important. So just to illustrate that, let's say for example somehow we had an orbiting positron. So mu would, would, uh, would point upwards and because the, direction, uh, because the direction of the current would be reversed. Okay, so that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.